Hi everyone, it's Dawn Fisher, Morning Glory Needleworks. Welcome to my 34th uh, floss tube video. I, as always, thank you to everybody who subscribed and liked and um, commented. I love comments. Um, as always, links to anything I talk about are listed in the description below the video on YouTube and um, about where you would comment and things. And um, I break my videos into, cha or into chapters, not channels, chapters. So you can um, just watch part or if you want to rewatch part, just go to the section of the description that says chapters and um, click on the timestamp next to the section you want to watch. And that will take you right to that section. You don't have to scroll through and try and figure out what I'm talking about um, at that time. So um, today, well, actually, uh, Sunday was Mother's Day. So I, I just want to wish everybody a happy Mother's Day, including my wonderful mother, Marilyn Fisher. We are going to be doing a Zoom for a Mother's Day Zoom. So everybody that's all over um, the country. We have family all over Texas, Michigan. I'm in Florida. And so that way, Arizona. So that way, everybody can see mom. Wish her a happy Mother's Day. Plus all the other moms. We have a lot of moms in my family. So I just wanted to wish everybody um, a happy Mother's Day. So it's the 15th of May, 2023. Say, and I got some fun things to talk about in this floss tube. So um, I want to get started here. So as I talked about, I've talked about this quite a bit, but there's only a couple more uh, floss tubes before uh, registration closes. But again, I'm going to be teaching the Star Spangled Sampler class um, online for um, over EGA. So if you haven't registered yet, there's a link that down, a link um, in the at the end. I think it's the very last link that's there. To get more information on the class, it's all going to be online. You buy your own supplies. You will get the pattern. The class will be broken into four sections. So it'll be every two weeks. There'll be a different lesson for a different portion of the um, of the sampler. You'll get the complete instructions um, well, over the four lessons. I'm going to do some videos, which is next on my list of things I have to get done. Um, usually I teach this as a two-day class, so I'm trying to break my two-day class into four lessons, and um, then I'm going to record videos for each of those four lessons, because I usually give a little talk, and you learn something about the Star Spangled, the original Star Spangled Banner. Um, so anyway, uh, registration opened May 3rd. I'm so excited They've had a lot of people sign up, so I'm I'm really thrilled, and I thank everybody that signed up. This is going to be a lot of fun, so I'm excited about this. And again, you do, do need to be an EGA member to take the class and sign up, but it's easy to sign up. Actually, right now is um, sign-up time, but if there isn't a chapter near, near you, you can join as a member at large, or I'm in Cyber Stitchers, which is ex actually in the Tennessee Valley region. Um, and it's an online chapter and everything's done online. So they even have their meetings online. They do classes also. So anyway, that's something else you can look into. Um, registration closes June 7th. So you need to get registered before June 7th. And then the first lesson will be posted August 2nd. And then um, there'll be August 16th, August 30th, and September 13th are the days when the lessons will be posted and they'll be available. I don't know for how long, but uh, they'll be available for a while online after that. So anyway, again, I'm really excited about this. Um, this is my first time and I'm so excited because so many people um, have registered. I've seen a lot online about it. Um, EGA, um, actually, sorry, I have an itchy eye. EGA um, actually posted a picture, part of the sampler as their uh, Facebook um, 
their header on Facebook. So that was really exciting. So that's that's that exciting news. I, I'll probably be talking about this for a while because I'm just so excited. This is such a good opportunity for me. And I know a lot of people wanted to take the class, but sometimes it's hard to get enough of a group of people to bring in a teacher or even do a Zoom online class, which I do teach over Zoom. So I have taught that over Zoom. I was in Florida, they were in California and it went over really well. We had a great time. So that's the information about the EGA online class. And again, the link is posted in the bottom. Next, I want to get back to talking about some of my antique and vintage needlework accessories. Some things are new, but most of them are um, vintage. But uh, so I wanted to talk about um, get some stuff so I can reach it here. Um, the tem or, uh, I want to talk about pin cushions in general. So this is your basic tomato pin cushion. This is probably pretty recent. It says it's made in Japan. I don't know how old it is. I just happened to have it. It still has a string from the price tag where I picked it up. But um, so you all know about the tomato pin cushion, but did you know the first recorded origins of the pin cushion date back to the Middle Ages? Not necessarily tomatoes, but pin cushions in general. In the English language, they became uh, known by many names. I'm probably going to pronounce some of these wrong because they look kind of weird. So they're pimpilos, pimpilos, pimplos, uh, pin pillows, and pin puppets. Those were early, early names for uh, pin cushions. So in 1376, a gentleman was or a woman was bequeathed a silver pin case in a French text called the Testament of Advice written by a woman known as La Montour. I don't know how to pronounce that correctly. So, um, so as early as 1376, and I'm sure as soon as pins came into being, somebody figured out some way to keep them handy. So, um, and by the uh, other, uh, it says other references to pin cases during the medieval era also exist. And by the 16th century, these uh, were referenced as pin pillows. And some examples from various parts of Europe survive that have elaborate embroidery. There's small, small porcelain baskets with pin cushion inside were highly popular as were small pin cushions such as wedding pillows or maternity pillows embroidered with messages. Typically the pin cushion was filled with cotton, uh, wool, horsehair, sawdust, although uh, some were filled with emery powder, which is, this probably has sand in it because it's fairly new, but um, emery powder to sharpen and clean your needles. Um, the pin cushion filling needed to be small enough, though, not to dull the tip of the needle. You don't want anything hard or abrasive in there when you stuck it in that would might uh, make your needle dull. And but you want it, whatever's in there to be big enough not to leak out through any holes. Matter of fact, I have I have a bunch of pin cushions here. I'm just trying to find one. Now, I thought I, oh, here it is. This one, this is your typical little, the strawberries attached. Again, this is um, just your vintage, fairly recent, uh, but it has a hole in it. And I don't know if you can see, but there's a little bit of sawdust coming out of the hole there. So that's, um, you don't want it, anything in there small enough. Usually I would think the emery's would be lined so they wouldn't um, leak out. So I've got a few different strawberry pin cushions. I actually have, kinda, or I mean tomato. This is this is a single strawberry emery that I have. This is, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's silk or satin fabric, but, and I have these, I have two that are the same with these weird little shaped strawberries sticking out of the top of them. These are the exact same fabric. It's got like a little plaid. I don't know if you can 
see plaid design to it. These are really common um, if you go to antique shows and stuff, obviously, because I have two of them. Um, I don't know where I got them. I'm sure at a flea market or an antique show somewhere. And this is a little matching, another little matching strawberry emery. Of course, this is an emery in the top here. So uh, let's see what else. Um, I have sawdust now on my paper here. So during the 18th century, weighted pin cushions became popular among seamstresses. In England, seam clamps, what they call them, attached to a table and were designed for holding hems for sewing. Um, and they became common and were often in the shape of the bird. The tail would be pinched to open and close the beak, which held the fabric. Um, and attached to the back or the top of the bird was a velvet pin cushion. And I actually have some of these sewing birds. They can be very expensive. I probably didn't pay much for them because I don't like to pay a lot. But one of these days I will bring some of my sewing birds out and talk about those. Um, some are actually shaped like birds. Others are just little clamps that clamp onto the table. Um, and one, very popular design is that of the tomato, often with a, a small attached strawberry containing emery powder. The tomato design was uh, most likely introduced during the Victorian era, and it's commonly stated that the origin of this design was a belief that placing a tomato on the mantle of a new house guaranteed prosperity and repelled evil spirits, and that if tomatoes were out of season, families improvised by buying a round ball of red fabric filled with sand or sawdust, which also became a place to store pins. However, this statement appears to have no basis in historical fact, and pin cushions in the shape of many different vegetables were common in the Victorian era. I don't know. I... um. I got that off of Wikipedia, so that's up to uh, different things. I've heard the story. I'm sure you have. It's gone around on Facebook about the um, the tomato pin cushion and what they were, how they came about. It's an interesting story. I don't know if it's true or not, but I like it. It's very interesting. So, um, and there's a lot of different other kinds of um, pin cushions that are out there also. This is my little... Um, I guess it's a girl. Yeah, little Scottish girl. And she's got a big dress. They actually have pins in the bottom. I don't know if that's holding her dress together or what, but she's got little pins in her, her skirt here. She's got her little bonnet on. That may be a man, actually. I'm not sure. That's awfully big for a kilt, if that's a man. But anyway, this is one of my... Um, I have a lot of different pink cushions anyway. So that's one of my cute little ones from my collection. Um, this one, I have another one here. This is made from um, maybe sweet grass. I think it's sweet grass. This one's, and they're woven. This is a fairly new one. Um, I don't know when this one was made. I know when I went to uh, Charleston, there was women that made a uh, sweet grass sweet grass baskets and I have a few bigger ones but I found this one at a, um, a flea market somewhere and picked it up just different types of um, pin cushions and here is another one this is actually a shaker pin cushion and these came in um, sets this is a really nice it's got like the it's been well used um, it's quite old the um, velvet has worn away quite a bit. It's maybe stuffed with horse hair. I'm not sure. It's it's soft. It's not sawdust. So uh, that may be stuffed with that. Oh, here's the other one. I love this one. And I thought this one was appropriate. I'm actually not sure if it was originally a pin cushion, but somebody um, used it as one. That's why I purchased it. See a lady with her fan and her, her flowers there. And if you open it up, I can. It's actually a Mother's Day card. I thought this was wonderful. I didn't even realize it was until today when I was looking at it and I opened it up and I went, oh my, 
It says, when Mother's Day is over, won't you keep this souvenir to remind you that you're always very lovable and dear? And the countless loving wishes that are tucked inside it too are meant to hope that every day brings happiness to you. So I tried to look this up online. I couldn't find anything that looked uh, like it. I'd say probably uh, mid-century. This is, it says created by Paramount on the back. It says 100 HMD, maybe. I don't know what that means. But anyway, I just thought that was really cute and quite appropriate. For Mother's Day. I think that's those. Um, so I want to talk about another type of um, pin cushion. Um, this is something I'm going to get into in more detail later. This is Mocklin, Mocklinware, Mocklinware. Um, uh, it's a Scottish souvenir woodware is what it is. It's known as Mocklin wear because the vast majority of these um, small wooden items bearing pictures designed to appeal to the 19th century tourists were made in the Ayrshire town, Ayrshire town of Mocklin. It's spelled M-A-U-C-H-L-I-N, Moshline, but it's pronounced Mocklin. And uh, Mocklin is a small town 10 miles east of Ayr, or Ayr, and it's known for its connections with the Scottish national bard, Robbie Burns, Robert Burns. He lived there with his wife, Jean Armour, who came from Mocklin, and there's actually a museum uh, now where they lived. So um, this uh, souvenir wear was made by the Smith family, uh, and it was favored by affluent Victorians traveling abroad. And it, the wood is actually a uh, sycamore, um, predominantly made of sycamore. And I have several items. I have other items too that aren't pin cushions. And that's something else I may haul them all out and um, show you those. This, um, this one, I'm not sure it's, this is a little thing. It says dance pavilion. They had a little transfer wear um, they have buildings, different things on them. And if you can see it, it's hard to see. Um, and this one, I actually, this side has the dollar institution. I don't know what that is. I'll have to look it up. This side here is Castle Campbell, which um, the Fisher clan, or Fishers are part of the Campbell clan in Scotland, and this actually says, made from wood grown in Castle Campbell Glen. So I thought that that's one of the main reasons I bought this one, but I bought it. And it's a little box, but it's a pin cushion on top. And this other one is also obviously a pin cushion on top. And like I said, eventually, oops, I will, um, I'll do another, uh, Another time I will uh, talk about all my Moshlin wear because it's not all needlework related. But in the next one, these are, um, I really love these. Um, I picked them up at various flea markets. And from what I could find on online, these pin cushion dolls were either made by the Zuni or Navajo tribes. Most of the records I found would the pin cushion dolls that were similar to this were, um, they said they were Navajo. So if you know, please let me know because I'm no expert on this. Um, like I said, I did do some research. I found a few that were very close to this. This one, um, let me show her. This one, her little, her whole body, her whole top is all beads. Some of the ones like this had cloth or bead heads, like a big wood bead, but she is all beads. And then she has these little um, beads and she's a, oh, it's coming apart. That's what, that's actually the thread that's holding this on. I'm gonna need to fix that. This thread in the back here is holding this on. They probably just went around and went in and out. And this is actually, feels like cotton like real cotton, not, not just stuffing. 
these just have a fabric bottom, but it's like a burgundy velvet. Um, but I just love it. It's so cute. And then this one, I really love this one, this bigger one. Look at her face. She's got a beautiful face. She's got these wonderful earrings, which are sticking out that are like beads. This is a velvet material, and she has this uh, satin band. I'm sure these were made, these were made um, for sale. These were not made um, for their use, um, the Native Americans. And she's got her uh, spangles here and around there. And she has um, her hair. I know some of them had mohair hair, and I'm not sure what this is. It may be yarn. I know it's tied back with a little piece of yarn. And it, she's faded. She's very faded and dirty. And uh, trying to open up some of these wrinkles here. But she's real. She was originally a beautiful shade of blue. I wish, I wish she wasn't so faded because it it's a lovely, lovely shade of blue. But these are um, some of my favorites here. These two are the um, special. Now I saw them online. Of course, I saw them on eBay and Etsy for sale. And ones like this, they were listed anywhere from a starting of $9.99, which is very inexpensive. I didn't see what shipping was, so you never know. You know, they're soft and not heavy. Um, but some people were asking hundreds and hundreds of dollars for them. That doesn't mean they're going to sell for that much. I mean, you can ask whatever you want for something, but that doesn't mean it's going to sell. Same with this one I found. Uh, the ones I found online, I don't think were as old as this one. Um, she just looks very aged. She does, Her face is painted, but it's very worn. Um, so you can barely see it, but um, it's old. She has a pin in her there. Anyway, these are um, two of my favorites. So that is some of my collection of pin cushions here. Let me put them all back. Oh, wait, I forgot. This one's kind of a weird one, and I like weird stuff. I found this one on, I think it was on eBay, and it's also probably Navajo or Native American. I know it's Native American. If the other ones are Navajo, this one probably is too. And it was kind of different. And I showed it to Jeffrey one time and he got it for me for Christmas. If you don't like this kind of stuff, that's okay. But I just thought it was very unusual. Some little uh, turquoise and uh, red beads around the edge. And yes, it's a deer foot. They used all sorts of stuff. I'm sure, again, this was made for trade. I've seen other items. Um, I've even seen, I think, horse feet and cow feet, too. Just, just saying. But anyway, it's the only one of these I have. But that's one of the more unusual ones in my collection. <laughs> now, um, last, last time, just two weeks ago, I talked about my... Um, my sampler, this one's from, from 1885. I talked to you about that. It's um, really long. And I told you last time in uh, Floss 233 that I had it all charted and all the diagrams done. Roll this back up again. And uh, you also know that originally I did this small sampler here with just the borders and these dividing bands from that sampler and the basic outline. And I put the year in the bottom and my initials in the top. But when I found this again, when I was going through some stuff, I thought I'm, I decided to go ahead and reproduce it. And I showed last time, this is um, part of the chart and the diagrams that I'm going to be using to stitch it. And I'm so excited. I actually started it. And I've gotten quite a ways, really, because I haven't been working on it that long. But I'm telling you, I love this so much. Isn't it beautiful? It's just, it's a lot of fun. It, um, and I can get close enough to really see the 
stitches. This is kind of a Bargello type stitch. There's some straight stitches, Bargello, flame, Irish, whatever you call it. These are kind of like an upright or diamond shaped Smyrna cross, but each block actually has different colors. So there aren't the same, there's a few colors that travel throughout, but almost every block has um, different colors in it. So I decided um, this, the original, you can see how much smaller this is. Let me, this up here and this here, see how much smaller mine is than the original? This is done on 24 count canvas um, with wool, wool floss. There is a little bit of maybe silk or cotton floss in there too, but this is done on 24 count um, with wool. And I am stitching mine on 28 count with DMC floss because it's easier um, to use and to get a hold of. So you can see how much smaller this one is. Um, the original is about six inches wide. And I think the design area is about maybe 48 inches long. And um, so I'm using 28 count linen, cream colored linen for the sampler. So obviously it's much smaller. So I'm calculating the finished size will be about four inches wide, which it is. It's about four inches wide. And the full sampler will be 36 inches long. So, and the border and these dividing bands, they're this um, green DMC, dark, dark green. And they're actually, I'm doing them in tent stitch, which is how they were done on the original on the canvas. So it actually works up pretty quick um, if I just sit down and work on it. And so anyway, but that's what I've been doing every evening is working on this. I actually haven't been um, working on it very long. Um, this section, I used three strands to make sure it gave really good coverage. This section is two strands. Uh, I went ahead and used two strands to give good coverage for the 10th stitch, even though it's, it's over one. The whole thing, I mean, it's all 10 stitch over one, and then these are counted out. Um, the stars are like 12 threads high and six threads wide. So um, each block will be a varying pattern. This is the next pattern that I'm doing. I'm really excited. This one's done um, in shades. It's hard to see. It's done in um, ecru or off-white and shades of... Um, lavender purple with a little gold some little gold stitches there if you can I can't tell if that's in focus <laughs> but anyway so that's what I'm working on I just wanted to keep I told you I would keep you updated so I'm uh that's my update and that's it for this video um if you have any questions uh comments please let me know what you think of everything I'm hoping to get this done soon I'm probably going to try and finish it pretty much the same as this one. This actually, I'll finish a little bit better. We were trying to figure out at one of my stitching groups what this fabric is. I don't know if it's has wax or something, but it's very smooth, but it's fabric. And then it is lined, lined with paper. I don't know why. Just a piece of, make sure that's plain. Yeah, it's just some plain paper. Um, I won't be doing that, but I'll probably, I'll probably make it the same as maybe a bell pull, but uh, fabric on the back. And this has um, silk ribbon on the edge, which you can see, oops, is wearing away. I need to put this down before I damage it anymore. But um, the silk ribbon is kind of coming apart. So She's gonna go back over in her corner. I don't know who stitched it. The initials are MM1885. So I know it was stitched in 1885. Um, I've had it for many, many years. I got it on uh, eBay many, many years ago. So that's it for Floss Tube 34. Um, again, thank you to everybody. Um, don't forget to share your photos 
um, of your Stitch of the Month sampler in the Stitch of the Month Facebook group. There's links in the bottom to my Etsy shop, to uh, my Morning Glory Needleworks, um, Instagram, Facebook, all sorts of, I have a lot of Facebook groups and pages. Um, so that's it. That was really short. I'm uh, got to get ready for uh, Mother's Day call. So that's it for this floss tube. And I will see you on the 1st of June. Thanks again for watching.